between people and cocktail hour. So, but we promise we're going to make it interesting um, and informative and and real too. We're going to get into some real stuff in our short amount of time. So, uh, once again, I'm Jeanette Pierce with City Institute. Our mission is to provide a deeper understanding of Detroit so that locals and stakeholders can be better equipped to shape an equitable and thriving city. We've taken 150,000 people uh, on learning journeys around the city to help them understand neighborhoods and people and places and projects here uh, for locals by locals. I'm a native Detroiter, grew up on the east side, uh, which you'll hear a little bit more about from Donna. Uh, but I'm going to interject a little and try to keep this, uh, this boat afloat for the next 38 minutes and 50 seconds. So let's start with um, a little bit of an overview of your work and how that work is connecting the past to the future. Chris, since you're directly to my left. Uh, good evening, everybody. I wish you could all have a cocktail during this session. I think that would make it more informative, more engaging, more entertaining. But um, I'm Chris Moyer. I'm the Senior Director of Communications and Government Relations for Visit Detroit otherwise known as the uh, Metro Detroit Convention and Visitor Bureau. We are the first Convention and Visitor Bureau in the entire world, founded right here in Detroit in 1896. So 127 years young. Um, when I think about the story of Detroit and I think about our history, to me, this is, this is a story of movement. Uh, people have been living on this river for thousands of years. Peoples whose name we're, we're, we will never know, but this is, this is, we do know that this is the home of the Ottawa, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi tribes. Uh, this is their ancestral land. This is their land today. When we fast forward just a little bit uh, and contextualize this in the Eurocentric perspective, we all know this is a city that uh, got its start in 1701 because of this river. And Movement is at the very heart of our DNA, coming from that river. We didn't invent the automobile. That was invented in Germany uh, in the late 19th century. But we changed the way the world moved. We, with the assembly line, the first paved road, the first stop sign, the first tricolored traffic light, the first highway, these are things that are local to Detroit. And we change the world and move the world with our music, from soul music to Motown to techno that all were born here in Detroit. Uh, this is an incredibly an insp inspiring place. We are a, a city that has, there is, no, there is no finish line to Detroit where, hey, we've done a great job. Let's pat everybody on the back and say we, we've solved all the problems. The problems that Detroit has right now are the result of, of a multitude of factors. But, but number one, let's be very, very clear. Systemic racism is, is at the core of the challenges that we have created for ourselves over the last 100 years and at the very core of our problem, uh, of our challenges today. Uh, Detroit, as it's reinventing itself, this isn't a comeback. This is a better fulfillment of the promise of opportunity. And it's really critical as we sustainably think about the future of Detroit, uh, that we think about how we, how we can more equitably benefit from advancements in uh, economic opportunity as, as the city uh, grows with billions of dollars of economic uh, development happening right here. I mean, this is an example of it. And just across the street at, at Michigan Central is, is one of those things. So I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic about the city of Detroit and optimistic about the direction that we're going as long as we take that step back and think about how we can be inclusive in that uh, shared prosperity. Stealing my history lessons there, Chris. Yes, um, you're hired. You're a tour guide right there. <laughs> um, okay. So, Melanie, and maybe specifically more about your Greek Town. Um, how many people have been to Greek Town? I think that's a pretty much, you know, how many people Yay. know it was actually settled by the Germans? All right. Trapper's Alley. It's a whole thing. Um, but, okay, we're not going to get in all that. But, you know, talk about, it should be on. I think it's just, was on. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. So go ahead. So past and present in your work uh, with the Greek Town Partnership. 
Yes, uh, Melanie Markowitz. I'm an urban planner and historian, and I'm very passionate about cities and extremely passionate about Detroit. Uh, I currently serve as the executive director of Greektown Neighborhood Partnership, which is a nonprofit community development organization for the Greektown District. Um, and as uh, Jeanette said, it was uh, first developed in the 1830s by German immigrants. Uh, so what I'm particularly passionate about um, between bridging like urban planning, history, um, the past and the present, not only in Greektown, but across the city is, is telling the story of of ourselves, not just people who are here, but the story that is relevant for us today. Uh, Greektown has almost 200 years of history, and it has been the landing ground of a variety of immigrant groups. Um, and it's called Greektown. It used to be called Germantown. Today, it's called Greektown. Uh, we're working on some really exciting projects that not only harness the historic architecture and character of this district, which is the last remaining kind of contiguous block, blocks, in fact, of Victorian architecture, but what makes it so special is this story, that immigration story of Greek immigrants and immigrants from many backgrounds coming into this district as their first entry point into sometimes America, certainly Detroit, and the state of Michigan. Um, and today it is, it is, you know, a place where everybody is welcome. And as the downtown landscape has changed dramatically, especially over the last 10 years, Greektown remains a place um, that feels authentic and wel welcoming to everyone. So we're working on a lot of public space projects, including a complete redesign and pedestrianization of Monroe Street, some new park plazas. Uh, we're working on historic preservation work for Second Baptist Church of Detroit, which is the oldest African-American American congregation in the state of Michigan. Um, by the way, stop on by. It was the last stop on the Underground Railroad as well. Um, so 1836 by 13 former enslaved people. That's what 1836, you guys. Thank you. 1836. Yes. Um, so I'm really passionate about like in designing, you know, the future, especially when it comes to like public space and historic preservation, like physical fabric is like wonderful. But what really makes, you know, all these places specials are the stories that we share together. And I think Detroit has a really unique story in so many ways. Uh, through my career, I've had really had the opportunity to work on a variety of African-American civil rights sites in this city. And, you know, it's, it's less about physical pat fabric and more about that special place that um, people hold in their hearts for this city and especially the people in this city. So I'm really, really proud to talk to you today about how we're doing community engagement, what kind of projects we're all working on uh, to improve the quality of life for Detroiters. All right, Donna, bring us home on this question. Uh, how, a little bit about yourself and your work and then how the past and the future are being bridged in the, on the East Side. Thank you. Um, Donna Givens Davidson, I'm president and CEO of Eastside Community Network, which will celebrate our 40th year next year. Um, we used to be called the Warren County Development Coalition, and we have 40 uninterrupted years of building power and, and um, you know, trying to build people driven planning, people driven activities, and addressing the needs of our, our community. I'm also a lecturer at Columbia University with the focus on um, urban sustainability in Detroit. And it, when I was offered the opportunity at Columbia, I had to do a lot of reading, right? And I was like, okay, I have to have 14 weeks worth of material. And I have about, you know, a day and a half. So I um, did a lot of reading, did a lot of studying. And I, I, every, the more I learned about Detroit's history, the more fascinated I was about the, first of all, the long and enduring significance of Detroit in black, for black Americans, period. From the very time that Detroit was founded to um, the the 1800s when Detroit was a gateway to freedom and we had one of the few underground railroads that was managed by black people, right? Second, uh, Second Baptist Church was a black church, but there was this black pride that existed in Detroit even before Henry Ford paid people $5 a day. And when people came to Detroit earning $5 a day, it was the only place in the nation people could go black or white and get paid the same wage. Now, the black folks might have to work in the foundry and not get the best jobs, but the reality was just the idea of creating that kind of economic opportunity um, brought people to Detroit who were seamstresses, who were home builders, who were attorneys, who were doctors, because now you can have people who can actually afford your services. You had black musicians. Black Bottom was one of the most 
um, you know, um, celebrated places for um, black entertainment in the nation. Harlem, then Black Bottom, number two. And all of this gave rise to, you know, you look at people like the um, young people in Motown and you realize, wait a minute, they were actually making music when they were in high school? How could they do that? Why weren't they working? Like other people had to work because people had a middle class lifestyle. Um, I was an adult and I went out of town one time and people say, you act like you're from Detroit. And I said, what does that mean? Because black Detroiters, we carry ourselves differently. We act, we expect things, okay? We are not grateful. We expect to be treated as equals. And that's our history. That's who we are. And sometimes it comes across as anger at changes when black folks are not included in a lot of the decision making that's going on. If you're going to honor the past, then you have to honor the beautiful, rich history of Black Detroit, the significance of Black Detroit, a city that once had the highest number of homeowners, the highest number of Black businesses, the highest number of people going to college, and it was the engine of upper mobility for Black people all across the nation. People looked to Detroit as the promised land. So when you honor that, then you have to have something equivalent to an area where you that history is told and preserved. And when you honor that, then you have to understand that there are 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds and 70-year-olds who are living in the city right now who helped build that and never left. And somehow we've got to honor them. A lot of these people are losing their homes. A lot of these people cannot afford to maintain their homes. They live in neighborhoods that are not target neighborhoods by the city because the city has decided this is not the best investment process. If you read Bridge Detroit that today, you'll see an article on Willie Mae Gaskins. Beautiful picture of a beautiful woman, one of the best people you'll ever meet. It's online. Google it, Bridge Detroit, and look up Willie Mae Gaskins. She lives in our neighborhood on a block where there are houses all over the place that are abandoned. She still maintains her home. She's almost 90 years old. She has her theme, Keep on Stepping, and she does beautiful work inside the community. But she lives on a, house, on a block where houses could not be torn down because she was not in a targeted area for the city of Detroit. Trees growing up through houses on her block, where sidewalks are cracked and water mains, mains were broken, and where they tried to actually dispossess her of her home because they said that she was not a homeowner and she did not have the right to have, claim homestead taxes on this home property when her husband died and they did not realize that she was also the owner. And so she's been fighting the good fight Honor her, honor Barb Martin, honor the many beautiful people inside of our neighborhood and make it possible for them to pass on their legacy to a next generation. That's what we try to do. We try to cultivate power. We try to connect generations. We try to speak on behalf of people. And we try to make sure that every single person on the east side of Detroit, whatever their background, is treated like they matter, is included in decision making, and has equal access to the kinds of resources that anybody coming to Detroit should have. So it's not us old time, it's not legacy Detroiters versus new Detroiters, but you can't build a bridge when you have um, a, a weak base on the, in the past and expect it to be a solid bridge to the future. You've got to strengthen the past and connect it to a strong future and make sure that people who matter exist on both sides of that bridge, past and future. All right. Yes. Amen. So we're going to start and keep on in that conversation. So people are the center of Detroit. When you ask Detroiters, when we had our call before this, why Detroit? You're always going to say, hear people talk about the, the people. You know, we have assets, we have challenges, but and the many examples that uh, Donna just shared. So, Donna, could you talk about how we, how ECN and the work you guys are doing is centering the people that are, you know, how do you lift up people, engage them in creating that future so that they're the base of the bridge uh, for the future? And then we'll come back around with that question. So I found an easy way to describe it. I'll use five fingers, starting with strengthening people, then building power, cultivating wellness, restoring neighborhoods, and stewarding resources. We start with strengthening people. And then we work to build their power. And we build power through fellowships, through training, through um, co coalition building, through many grants and investments in the work of residents across the city. 
Um, and then we also build power by um, responding to concerns. So we held a meeting on Tuesday when we found out the city council districts were being redrawn and um, that there was going to be um, a council discussion about that next week. We wanted the community on the east side to weigh in. We called a meeting on Monday. The next day, 100 people showed up, and they were powerful. We had our city council members represented at this meeting and explaining things to people. Um, we also, I teach a class once a month. Can there be race? Can I interrupt that real yes. quick? Because that's amazing, right? 100 people in a 24-hour turnaround. Yes. So I think the follow-up with someone's wanting to be able to do this you know, in, when they're engaging the community, uh, you know, how did you do that? How did you reach out to them? Um, I'm, and I'm guessing the part of the answer is you already have the relationship and the trust that's been built. But how, how what different ways were that was that meeting communicated? In at, during the pandemic, we lost a lot of people. We have a 17,000 square foot building that was donated to us by Henry Ford Health Systems, and we turned it into a wellness hub. And we made membership free or up to $20 donation to people in the community. We have 36 classes a week on everything from Zumba to, uh, we have a Bid Whist Club. We have- um, um, Google that dancing, for all the young folks out there. All yeah. kinds of stuff. Um, we, we just, whatever people want, we have a lot of classes every week and we're open Monday through Saturday. We now have almost 1300 residents enrolled as members. So we're serving the community. They know who we are. We provide youth programs. We've got teen programs. We have wellness support for people who are experiencing different kinds of health issues. And um, we help organize the community. Um, a few years ago, one of the residents in the community mentioned that nothing that is happening is happening in the neighborhood that she lives in. And she said, what about us? And so I said, okay, well, you don't have a lot of housing. This is one of the areas that's not a hardest hit area. Why don't we bring you together and come up with a plan? And so she named that area the Goodstock Neighborhood. And now if you talk to a city official, they'll talk about Goodstock as a neighborhood, but it was named by a resident and we helped give them power. And then we were able to bring in U of D Mercy to help plan around what that looks like. We got a grant to invest in many grants through to create transit projects in the community. So when you're continually trying to serve and connect and meet people, then I think that people know and trust you. But I have to say that the other thing that was really surprising to me was that many of the people, a few of the people who showed up had never heard of our organization, had never heard of the LEAP Coalition, which is a coalition we found, and came there. We had young people showing up. And so I think the other thing is word of mouth. It can't be just you telling people to come. People have to tell other people to come. And I, that was really exciting to me. That's really awesome. Um, okay, Mel, well, and again, we could be here all day. I'm always, I'm always saying I have to play good cop and bad cop by introducing amazing people and then saying, okay, now you can't talk to them anymore. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to stay around after. We'll have questions that you can ask and then maybe some offline questions as well. Um, Melanie, the past and the future in Greektown is... Get it, is is a, is a big swath of, of a change there. How are you connecting with the people and businesses in Greektown um, about this change uh, uh, that they that's coming? Thank you. Uh, I get so excited about Greektown because the thing that is so wonderful about it is that it is authentically Greek. And it's not just Greek restaurants, and we have many. Um, but most of the property is owned by Greek immigrants that have been there for generations. Uh, some businesses, they're on their third generation of ownership, keeping it entirely in the family. So as one would imagine, you have a, a lot of pride in that family legacy of, of coming to America for the first time from abroad and really laying down roots and starting several businesses in a community. And I, I'm happy to say it's still there. Uh, so, you know, how, how do we redevelop a neighborhood, fill in some of the, the missing components in the urban realm that were kind of taken away um, with urban renewal in some parts of Greek town? You know, uh, over 50 percent of, of the area of Greek town is vacant, most in the form of uh, surface parking lots. Uh, we recently got rid of one of those surface parking lots, by the way. Um, 16-story residential tower built from the top down, that weird thing that everybody saw kind of floating in the sky, uh, the exchange in Greektown. Uh, and we're redesigning uh, Monroe Street, the main corridor of Greektown, to be formally pedestrianized, uh, a shared street with pavers, trees, outdoor cafes, 
And in the way that we're working with the community to do all of these projects and redesign projects is really working with the business and property owners and the public. Like what is going on today that is is wonderful and, and how can we really harness that in that unique character um, of, of the ethnic and cultural character of the community in addition to the architectural character? How can we harness those things for the future that is sustainable? Um, and I, I really liked one of the panels earlier Earlier today, uh, Brian Boyer said something, you know, thinking about designing something um, that's going to sustain for, for generations. You can see it evolving and changing. Like, how do you design something with that type of program flexibility and in context that is unique to a, a neighborhood uh, in a city? Um, and so we've been working on, on these kind of initiatives and our public engagement approach has been really to ask people what they want. Uh, and for Greektown, uh, it was resoundingly pedestrianized Monroe Street, resoundingly, and also to really celebrate the cultural heritage of the district, uh, certainly the Greek heritage, but also the German heritage. In this area, Greektown was also a, a part of Black Bottom, so it has a, a huge history of, of, of retailing uh, in so many communities. And so within the design itself, we're really working on that so that heritage and cultural interpretation is so much more than, um, you know, a sign that says on this date in 1914, I'm a historian, I get bored to tears with those things, um, can't even read them. But how do we actually build that into the cityscape and into interpretation that is meaningful for us today? Like, what does that mean to me as a Detroiter coming here? How is that meaningful for me today? How can I, you know, go into a restaurant and engage and really feel like this is authentically Detroit, this is authentically Greek town. Um, and we've redesigned so many of our, our businesses as well. There's been wonderful places. I really invite you to see the redo of Golden Fleece in Bacalico, which is a Greek uh, market and wine store. It is a really incredible place to be. And there's so many things going on in Greek town. So we really want to invite you to come back and experience that. Um, and so in our work, we're really trying to harness what is making Greek town great um, for multi-generational legacy, um, you know, ethnic community. And how do we harness that in a way um, for the public to enjoy where everybody still feels authentically welcome? I, I think in the city, as it's changed, there's some places, unfortunately, that, that no longer feel welcome to everyone. Um, they don't feel like they're invited to the party. Uh, and we want to make sure that as Greek town is redeveloped, that everybody is invited to the party and everybody feels like they want to invite their friend to the party. And it feels authentically welcoming to all different types of people, whether you live in the city, you know, live in uh, Detroit's neighborhoods or you're from the suburbs or you're from France, that coming to this place feels authentically Detroit and authentically Greek town. Thank you. So, Chris. A little bit. I mean, so the people obviously are all, we all are all about the people and you have the whole region to consider here. Um, so can you talk about how people, the people in our region are informing what's happening at Visit Detroit and even a little bit about um, the changes within the organization that, you know, people might not be as familiar with because it's maybe because it's happened over the last few years during COVID or maybe they just didn't really know much about it in the first place. Sure. I, I mean, and I think that this is both a challenge and an opportunity that Visit Detroit has. Our, our job is to bring visitors, meetings, conventions, events to Southeast Michigan. And by doing that, inject billions of dollars of economic activity from outside the region into Detroit, Wayne County, Oakland County, and Macomb County. And the specific numbers are we had 16 and a half million people visit us last year. They spent $9.2 billion dollars in our region. That's, an, that, that's the equivalent of every Jeep Grand Cherokee sold in the United States last year, plus 3,000 more uh, of economic activity of tourism meetings, conventions, and events. When we think about how to try to create a mosaic, and that's really what it is, this isn't a melting pot. We, we need to each have our own individual, unique uh, pieces of culture, whether it's German history, whether it's Greek history, whether it's Lebanese history, uh, black history that has uh, been here for, for centuries. Uh, D D Detroit is uh, one of the first places in the north that really saw significant immigration from Mexico. Uh, it's not always easy 
And I'm not going to pretend that we're going to do it right every single time. There are at least 105 neighborhoods in the city of Detroit. There are 138 communities in Southeast Michigan, 4.4 million people. I promise you, I will fail 10 times a day to try to represent every single person. But the, the idea is that we have something very, very special here. We have so many things that are very, very special here and more people should be coming here to visit. And we believe that when they come here to visit, some percentage of them will wanna stay here. And that corresponds with, with the governor's vision, uh, with other leaders' vision that Detroit and the state of Michigan is, is, a, is a place that needs to attract and retain more talent. Um, and just a little bit, because I've been excited to hear even just more um, focusing on Detroit. I mean, not that you didn't focus on Detroit before, but... We didn't focus on it enough. Yeah. I mean, in a 127-year-old organization, and I've been there for 20 months, um, but let's let's be very candid. From the 1890s until the late 1990s, this was an organization for white men. It was white business owners that were trying to bring white convention uh, goers to Detroit. And then we have another convention center in Novi, which is the 50th largest convention space in, in the United States. So yeah, let, let's, let, let, we don't need to shy away from that. Uh, so like he said, um, but you know, they had a lot to, lot to deal with, but there's been a focus and a change about, you know, even just in the name, right. It used to be the Detroit Metro Convention and Visitors Bureau. How many people and we're familiar with that organization, a handful here, right? Um, because they historically weren't doing much right in the city as much. Um, and, you know, even just to choose, like Macomb County at one point threatened us to secede from the Visitors Bureau, for example, right? We had this, we have this very fractured region. I think we're moving in the right direction. I think Visit Detroit um, plays a really great role in that and bringing the, the community together. Um, and in fact, even one of our, if you want to talk a little bit about how, um, what was the Kobo Convention Center, which is now TCF Center, uh, was Kobo, and that name was removed because he ran on a segregationist platform and was responsible for a lot of the urban renewal, and uh, so not the best uh, namesake for our major convention center. Um, but it was the project of getting the $300 million expansion and renovation was a great example of regionalism to start. Uh, so that's going to be my next round of questions is going to be about how do we connect beyond our, di our direct communities, right? So we're connecting with, we kind of talked about connecting within our communities and to the people there. Um, how do we bridge the connections, whether from the east side to the next neighborhood or west side then, or across the border to Gross Point uh, or whatever it might be? Uh, but we'll start and come back this way because I just want, it, he'll talk about convention center and then you get to bring us up there. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean that's a fascinating. It's a fantastic question, and 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 again, this is this is a journey. Uh, what you referenced in terms of we've got over the last decade, uh, Cobo Hall, then TCF Center, now Huntington Place is, and I think that's going to be the last name yeah, change for a while. Fault, so sorry, uh, blame it on the triplets. That's no, no, that's just, all right. Uh, yeah. uh, this is. This is in a really impressive building here. This is the 16th largest convention center in the United States. So we can host this many events, a lot of events, but we have 5,000 hotel rooms downtown and we could host events that, that really require 10, 15, 20,000 room nights in that convention hall but we, we don't do it because we only have 5,000 right now because people want to be close to downtown. As, as this relates to the regionalism, the convention center is, is overseen by a, a, a group of, of, uh, of, of the, it's five, it's the city plus the three counties plus the state of Michigan. There are commissioners that sit on a board that oversee that convention center. And the, the realization is, hey, we need to build a hotel next to the convention center to start attracting more people. Well, you got to you got to get everybody bought in on this. And the story that we have been telling for the last two years is uh, this will be beneficial for Macomb County. 
this will be beneficial for Oakland County. This will be beneficial for Downriver and Western Wayne County and the state of Michigan when we have more economic activity here. Getting people to buy into this sense of regionalism is essential so that each individual neighborhood in the city of Detroit can benefit a little bit more and each of those municipalities and counties can benefit a little bit more. Thank you. Melanie? I have a lot of thoughts on this. Bring it. So, so much may be kind of contentious, actually, and yeah. in the room, I'll, I'll prepare for that for after. Um, so, you know, how do we make these connections, you know, not only in Detroit and in the many neighborhoods that we have here, but more from a regional perspective and also an international perspective? And a, a lot of folks in this room, including Jeanette, says this all the time. But for the folks who haven't heard this, um, you know, Detroit is, you know, big enough to matter on the world stage, but small enough for you to matter in it. There's postcards um, at the front desk with that corner. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a really good one because it really is true. Um, if you go anywhere around the world, people are going to know about Detroit, whether it's because of cars or Motown. You know, they'll come up with one of those and then they'll know a bunch of other things about Detroit that may or may not be true. Um, but what I like to think about with Detroit, and I think we have this wonderful opportunity, particularly right now in the state of Michigan, is that as we're trying to grow our population, and, and we now have a specific foc on, focus on this at the state level, um, I think Detroit, we need to place more emphasis on it with that push to gain more population and talent and economic development, because Detroit matters not only for Southeast Michigan, but for the whole state of Michigan. If Detroit does not do well, the state doesn't do well. And yeah, that's right. That's right. And what I find so electric about living and working here is the people. It's so hard to describe unless you're, you're here a lot. There's these just like hidden beauties everywhere and beauties right out in front of your face. It's a place of discovery where you can help your neighbor, where there's this sense of creation and entrepreneurialism and like we can do it together. There's this sense of genuine creativity and hope there that is indescribable that I've never experienced any place else. And I think we really need to build upon that, especially from a regional, state, federal, and international level to really explain the stories of what is going on in this city. You know, New Lab included, like what is going on in this building? You know, it, it, you know, a lot of people don't know what's going on here. We really need to get better in telling that story of Detroit, that story of Michigan, and that story of passionate people. Um, <laughs> of Debbie Downer, right? There's two Detroits, and we don't want to acknowledge that. There's a downtown Detroit, which is financed by the Downtown Development Authority, which is funded by a tax capture, where all of the increases in property taxes can only be spent downtown. And all of the economic growth and all of the economic activity is benefiting a very small slice of the city of Detroit. We put a lot of emphasis there. And I think there was this bet that if we just grow this downtown, Detroit will grow. But it's shrinking. Right? Detroit is shrinking because what's not happening in the neighborhoods. You can have brand new. You, we have the Joe Louis Greenway. And I celebrate that. I love riding my bikes on the, the you know, river walk and stuff like that. But when people can't get their sidewalks fixed, when people can't get dead trees removed, when people can't get basic city services inside of communities where they've been for decades, at some point they leave. And we are building mostly studios, one bedrooms, micro studios downtown. So you were inviting one person into those studios that are subsidized by taxpayers, every single one of them, and whole families are leaving. So you have a four for one proposition, okay? I think it's important for us to have a real conversation about how to connect Detroit to Detroit. And when we figure out yes. how to connect Detroit to Detroit, I believe the Downtown Development Authority has done its job, okay? It was established to incentivize redevelopment downtown. Now we need to push that kind of activity into neighborhoods. And when we are able to do that, you know, Kiyaki Yamada Taylor introduced this concept of racist exclusion followed by predatory inclusion. And so if we are not careful, the way that we're growing, because everybody's excited about things that are happening. I know people who cannot afford to move back into the neighborhoods they grew up in. I know people who cannot afford, who, whole apartment buildings are being purchased and people are being given 30 days to move out 
And let's say you've been paying $600 a month for, tw for 20 years. Now you have to find a place for $600 a month and you can't. We have growing levels of homelessness. I think we have to be serious about dealing with the racist past of this city and dealing with the economic structures that locked people out before we celebrate bringing new people in. Because a lot of people are hurting in our community. The 100 pe people who showed up, you know what they talked about? They, they said, we talked about the reason you have to redraw city um, boundaries is because the District 4, where we're located, is shrinking. It shrank faster than any district in the city of Detroit between 2010 and 2020. And they said, why is that? We have all of these abandoned homes. Nobody's fixing them up. We have a demolition plan, but we don't have a rebuilding plan. And so those are the kinds of things as a region we need to ask ourselves about economic parity as a region and then within Detroit so that everybody and including all of the many, many, many wonderful people inside of the neighborhoods can benefit. And I think until we do that, it feels to me like it's smoke and mirrors to some extent in terms of how it's being addressed in the press. Can I jump in really quickly? Sure. I mean, Donna, I'm, I'm so glad you said all of that because it, it does, We. I, I am going to be perpetually optimistic, but I come to my perpetual optimism as somebody from exceptional privilege. I recognize that. Um, and it, 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 it saddens me, it disturbs me that more black people bought homes in Southfield between 2010 and 2020 than bought homes in Detroit. It saddens me that um, Hispanic people are leaving Southwest Detroit for Lincoln Park because there isn't that ease of access to services. So this goes back to that point that we are an unfinished story and there is no finish line to this. Um, and so I'm so glad that you brought that up. And I think that goes to the connection because you're right, connecting Detroit to Detroit. I think that is is really hits home. I mean, when we talk about downtown and the development, because it isn't, it can't be either or, right? It has to be, I mean, we need to be, the downtown had 100 abandoned buildings 20 years ago, right? And and I think you're right about the DDA. The Renaissance Center, when it was built and opened in 1977, was the largest privately developed project in United States history. $350 million, not a dime of public money, no city money, no state money. And it was right after that, that the TIF concept was created to make sure that that didn't have to happen again, that the, they could get some, you know, some state and city and federal money. Um, and the um, public schools and the public library have not seen the investment from any of that well, and those over those last 40 takes, years. It also, it captures taxes and steals them away from that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Let me say this. Yeah. If I broke my leg, I might need a crutch or I might need a wheelchair. But if I stay in that wheelchair too long, my muscles atrophy and it's going to be hard for me to get up and walk. There's a reason why the Downtown Development Authority was established. That reason no longer exists in 2020. Three, if we're being really honest, it does not make sense to me that we're still siphoning so much of our redevelopment activity in this area. Neighborhoods aren't getting that. And the other thing that's also so significant for a black Detroiter um, whose family has been here since 1919 is black businesses are being pushed out because very, very few of the developers who are getting reaping the benefit of this money are black developers in downtown of Detroit. So there's a mismatch between resources and equity. And I don't, I, I think you cannot deal with racism without talking about race and without being intentional. We've moved to this colorblind thing where we say, I don't see race. Well, see me, because I'm proud to be black. I'm happy to be black. And see me because also if you don't see me, then you don't have to care about me. And so that's all I'm saying. I agree with yeah. you about the past. I'm just saying moving forward, we can have a new reckoning and talk about the future. And if people understand and all the stories that we were talking about, understanding the past to understand why, because most people don't know about TIFs. Most people don't know how things are funded. Most people don't know that, you know, that Paradise Valley was destroyed or Black Bottom. There's so much history. And we mentioned this last time, but, you know, we have our Redlining Racism Segregation Tour. It's actually this evening uh, virtually, but I know we're going to be here. I mean, but every third Thursday, if you want kind of a little summary on how did we get here, because to your original point, 
how we can't move forward if we don't understand the past. And if we don't understand the past, then we're not going to see the need. People go, well, why do we have to change that? Um, you can't, if we don't understand the damage that things had caused over the years. Um, so I want to just do one um, small thing before we take questions and then let um, beverages um, happen. What is something I know we're not, it's not, and I will say this too, good and bad challenges and assets are not mutually exclusive. That's a big takeaway. You can have wins like the work that you guys are doing and, you know, with ECN and the Stoudemire Wellness Hub is a win that in terms of the work that you've done and people get to use it, but there's still a lot of people that might not know about it. So I think there's a, people need to know about things like that while also understanding and realizing the challenges that exist and, and what needs to happen to change that. So, um, what is something that you have done in your work, each of you, as we kind of wrap up that, um, can be modeled by other people that you would say, moved the needle, even if it's one tiny little step, you know, one, one takeaway, um, and not again, not in the Pollyanna way, but in a concrete, what lessons can people in the audience here take with them if they want to start making a positive move? Do you want to, do you want to start or end, Donna? I'll let you choose. I'll just say, you know, the Republic of New Africa has a saying, it was started in Detroit, free the land. The more that we can get people access to land and access to resources to improve that land, the more we're going to have equity. We don't have to worry about gentrification, climate gentrification, if people are controlling the land around them. Although I do have questions about how the land value tax will impact that. But I'm really proud of organizations that we have supported have their own projects. I don't want people to know about me. I want people to know about us. There's a lot going on on the east side, a lot of wonderful people doing great things. And the more we can make them visible and encourage more people to take control of their properties, we have a whole lot of vacant property and we can make a real change. Is there an example you want to share? Like... Manistique or Freedom Freedom? Or, I mean, um, we've got yeah. Sustainable Community Farms. We didn't f um, facilitate that, but we've got the owner of yeah. that right here, and she's doing some work. Um, you right. Have, That's a great example. Uh, Michelle, That's what I'm saying. Michelle so we has can... done, has, has been um, farming and engaging in community investment for, for years, right? You now have... we have the Black Farmers Land Fund, right? Exactly. And, the, exactly. and our, our very first... Um, Head of Agriculture for the City of Detroit. What's the title? Yes, um, Director of Agriculture. agriculture. You uh, have you have little community gardens started by Loretta Powell. We were the first money in, not by far, not the last. And she's got it going. We've got What About Us LLC. We were the first money in. Feed and Freedom Art Farms. We were the first money in there, as well as the um, the Detroit of Bloom and. The um, treehouse, you know, their their investments. Come see and what's going on on the inside. It may have been a small everybody. amount of money. It may have been five hundred dollars because sometimes that's all people need to really take control and really grow it well beyond anything they envisioned when we gave them their first money. So I think more of us should be investing in people's capacity to control and do great things in the community. Awesome. Okay, really quick, Melanie, Chris, anything you want to add around? great examples uh, or tips to learn, and then we'll take a question. Uh, my, my biggest advice to everyone in this room is to dream big uh, and dream out of the box, um, but use community in context to inform, inform that energy and passion. Uh, I have so many examples of this in my career. Uh, I'll, I'll speak about one that's near and dear to my heart. It's not in Greektown, by the way, although I am working on a lot of really exciting projects in Greektown. Uh, how many here are familiar with Hamtramck Stadium? Okay. All right. Great. Wonderful. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Hamtramck Stadium is, it is one of the last remaining Negro League era baseball stadiums in the country. Uh, and this is in uh, the city of Hamtramck, which is uh, two square miles completely surrounded by the city of Detroit. Uh, this project, uh, Hamtramck Stadium, uh, today is fully rehabilitated. It is used for all kinds of games, certainly uh, historic baseball exhibitions, but it's a community meeting place. Crooked is played there. Um, it, it's a place where so many wonderful activities happen. And uh, many, many years ago in my career, I was the city planner of Hamtramck. And when I came to that position, uh, Hamtramck Stadium was uh, publicly owned in the largest public space in the city. It was fenced off, crumbling, and was about to be demolished. Uh, nobody really knew what this resource was. But I knew, and I had a dream that one day 
we could stand on that field and that people whose parents played there and were not recognized by the Baseball Hall of Fame until three years ago could stand on that mound, see this physical place. Like having a physical place with so many memories is so powerful. Yeah, Negro Leagues. And in so much of black heritage in this country does not exist anymore. It was all torn down because of redlining and segregation. And, you know, a lot of this vernacular architecture just simply has not survived. And so to have such hollowed ground in a physical space survive and be rehabilitated is absolutely amazing. And that project was kickstarted by getting a pre-development grant, a grant from the National Park Service, uh, a civil rights grant. And here we are today. Yeah, and never give up. That's the kind of the thing. Never give up. Okay, Chris. Like the smallest okay. little seed makes the most impact. Yes. Like you never know where things are going to go with passion. It is a beautiful stadium. I actually got to play on it uh, last summer. So congratulations to you. That was, that's a, it's a, a tremendous place that everybody should go visit. Uh, for, for Visit Detroit, we don't own anything. We rely on the community, those 138 municipalities, the 105 neighborhoods, the attractions, the hotels. So we're storytellers. And if I'm proud of, of two quick things, first of all, it's that we're, we are really banging the drum loudly and proudly about Detroit and unabashedly what Detroit is. And we're going to do this even better. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, we've had accolades like Time Magazine calling us one of the 50 greatest places to visit in the world. We've got two more of those coming that you'll see here in the next month. Uh, two major travel publications saying Detroit is the place that you have to go in 2024. That's coming. And then in January uh, of next year, we are launching a brand, a, a new brand. And that new brand is a love letter to Detroit and to Detroiters. Um, and let me really tell you, excited. yeah, let really me tell you, look, this. it's not, you know, it's, it's still iterative. So when you see that brand and, and more people will see it outside of the city than inside of the city, because that's what that's what our mission is. When you see it, if you're not happy with it, that's OK. We, we want to continue to evolve and continue to tell the story of this region as proudly as possible. And that is going to wrap us up. I mean, but I think obviously lots of themes here, lots of lessons learned. We could go forever, but people are at the heart of everything. As you develop anything going back to the past, representing the people uh, is how we build an equitable future and thriving future for everybody. Um, we're not going to have time for questions right now, but if you want to see us after, I'm happy. We're happy to answer some offline, but um, we're getting a little bit behind time. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists.